what, I, what I'm talking about today is a, is a project that's funded by the Department of Energy, Office of Electricity. Um, it's part of an industry collaboration. So this is in uh, collaboration with Grid Protection Alliance, which was a spin out from Tennessee Valley Authority, which is a power utility in, in the south. Um, this also is uh, in collaboration with Pacific Northwest National Lab. I don't know if there's any PNNL people in the audience or not. But it's called ARMOR. Um, so ARMOR stands for Applied Resiliency for More Trustworthy Grid Operation. Um, I'll explain what that is and why it's in context here in a second. So a little bit about me. Um, as, as Jeanette said, I'm an Associate Director of Technology at uh, the Information Trust Institute, which is an institute under the University of Illinois. Um, I'm also an old school hacker, a longtime practitioner, and a current researcher. Um, so by that I mean um, I've been uh, in the scene, per se, and dealing with things like IDS systems for a very, very long time. Um, and some of the techniques that you guys defend against, I was probably the person that wrote them. Um, so lots of fun stuff. Twitter, Tim Yardley, Yardley at Illinois, if you want to contact me. A little bit about ITI. ITI works in trust and complex systems broadly. Um, so we do basically cybersecurity across critical infrastructure in many different domains. We have a lot of work in the power grid um, and um, lots of other aspects of critical infrastructure, health technology, robotics, unmanned aerial vehicles, um, various other themes along those lines. Data science, evaluation, science of security, we're an NSA science of security lablet, um, lots of stuff like that. Um, we were founded in 2004 with $250,000 of seed money from the uh, state of Illinois, so this harkens to Vern's talk about what it takes to, to make some of this. Since then, we brought in $100 million of research, um, and we're expecting another $25 million to, to hit here in another month or so. Um, so all sorts of cool stuff in collaboration. A lot of our focus has been on smart grid activities, which is where um, this work that I'm going to talk about stems from. One of the big ones is called TSIPG. That was mentioned by Jeanette, trustworthy cyber infrastructure for the power grid that started out as an NSF center and then was a DOE center. Um, and that really kind of spurred the, the, uh, the efforts that are here. And if you look along the right hands here, these are all projects that are industry um, uh, involved projects, Armor being one of them here. Um, and so those projects are, are um, really key to transitioning research to, to practice, building a community per se around it. So what is Armour? Um, so the motivation behind Armour was that industrial control systems, the protocols that, that are used in these critical infrastructures, the protocols lack fundamental security. There's, they were developed many, many years ago, a lot of cases not even developed to communicate across IP. Um, and they were original serial protocols that just take the serial payload and basically put it in the, the payload of an IP packet. Now they're IP enabled, right? So really, really broken. Um, security bolt-ons are, are typically implemented via firewalls and VPNs. So how they secure these is they say, okay, we'll put a firewall and keep people out. Well, as you know, keeping people out isn't uh, always possible. And when it is possible, um, it always isn't, isn't always effective. So they say, all right, well, we'll encrypt things. We'll use VPNs. Well, that's great, but they're encrypting everything, right? So all the traffic that comes in, including the hacker, um, gets encrypted, and they lose visibility um, there as well. Um, so we're, what's the key there? There's little, if any, visibility what's going on in these systems. They don't even monitor them. If you ask um, a lot of the companies that, that control the, the electric power grid what they're doing to monitor their endpoint devices, they're like, um, we ping the router. OK, that's great. Um, do you check your firewall logs? Yeah, yearly. You know, so that's the type of state that a lot of them are in. They don't even understand what network management systems are in many cases, or they have a third party company that maybe does something for them, but they don't know and there's no channel of communication there as to what they're actually doing. Beyond that, even just, you know, is somebody on my network? That's a problem, right? But what are the actual devices that are supposed to be behaving? What are they actually doing? So if you haven't heard of Stuxnet, I'll throw out the word Stuxnet, right? So Stuxnet was abusing the industrial control system process effectively, the control process of these. And you could have saw those communication paths potentially going across the network if you were looking. But people weren't looking, right? So the security extensions also that get added to these protocols. So they say, all right, well, there was a big effort by the government to, to add security to these protocols. And they said, all right, let's add things like DNP3 SA, secure authentication, right? That's great, but these devices in the field are out there for 15, 20 years. So in 15 or 20 years, we'll see DNP3 SA wide adopted, maybe. So they have a long tail. And the other big problem is companies there are perfectly willing to put security devices in place if they can. Um, but the problem is, is they'll spend $100,000 on a piece of gear, and it'll cost them $300,000 to deploy it. It's a lot, right? Why would it cost so much to just drop a network appliance in? 
regulation, you have to schedule outages, you have to turn off the power um, because it's an interruption of critical assets, um, you have to disconnect the line of service, depending on what you're touching, right? So there's all these sort of things you have to jump through. So the, the, the deployment costs are so much more expensive than, than the actual product itself in most cases. Now some of the products they charge an ungodly amount of money for that really don't deserve that, but that's a different thing. So what is Armor itself? It's a security appliance that really aims to increase the visibility, solving that problem, and awareness on these ICS networks. To augment these insecure protocols with security features, to inspect and optionally enforce defined policies on the system, and to minimize deployment costs. So to actually be able to put this in the field without having to do all these feasibility outages and all sorts of other things. So it has three different modes to do that. Passive, obviously, you can do a passive tap, right? And that's um, as non-invasive as you want, so standard span ports. A transparent mode, which is just doing inline inspection and an optional enforcement. Basically, just saying, I'm going to use a hardware bypass card. I bring in um, the data. I take a copy of it. I dump the data out on, another, on the other interface. Okay. The encapsulated side is where we're adding security and adding additional features there. So you have the inline inspection sort of stuff you had before. You have encapsulated transfer, which is done with a middleware layer I'll talk about in a second, um, with optional encryption. And then you have optional enforcement, again, that you can choose to enforce your policies on. So what do you get by deploying something like this? Well, you get on the passive, you get your network visibility and intelligence. On the tr transparent operation, you get everything in the passive, plus you get communication endpoints operating without any modifications. You don't have to reconfigure a device to, to do anything because you're just a bump in the wire that's technically not even there. Um, you have your optional policy enforcement and all sorts of other things. Obviously, in the encapsulation, you get the encapsulation and encryption. You get security augmentation, like access control, filtering, et cetera, on there as well. Um, and then you also have some fault tolerance and other things that you can do with the middleware layer. Um, you get enhanced access control, payload inspection, all the things that you can do with using Bro, obviously, here. So conceptually, what's it look like, right? You just drop a box, basically, between the switch and the router. And then you put another box on the other side if you're doing encapsulation. So you encrypt on one side, decrypt on the other, right? No big deal. So what's it look like in deployment? Well, um, in power systems, you have a control room. You have a whole bunch of substations. So you'll have the devices. IED stands for Intelligent Electronic Device. Um, basically just a generic device that's in the system that are communicating through the switch, which are communicating through the armor node, which then talks to the control center. So standard sort of hub and spoke style model. Whoops. So what is it built on? So we, we took Debian Wheezy as the, the base. Um, so that's our core operating system. We're, we'll, um, right now we're in kind of an alpha point at this point. Um, so we have packages that we've built for, for very, various different aspects. We have an armor proxy node, which is handling the middleware stuff. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Bro is part of the system, obviously. Um, NetMap is being used as the um, high-speed packet IO. Um, we're also, um, uh, well, we support multiple different modes, obviously. We can do libpcap, we can do NetMap, um, and then uh, um, pfring support as well. Um, you have a management and configuration interface, and then you have um, middleware layer, 0MQ. Um, and then we're using Curve ZMQ, which is elliptic curve cryptography for the, for the encapsulation. So we also wrote a C Sharp um, wrapper for Broccoli um, called Broccoli Sharp. Um, that's for offloading for some secondary computation and other things. We use BroStatsD, um, RSyslogD, and Etsy Keeper for um, tracking configs and other things like that. So when you build this stuff, what do you do? Well, um, it's all, we've made a, basically a localized um, apt repo for it. So you just apt get install armor node, and you have a full running armor node with basic configurations that then you can, you can go through. So no big deal. Um, we started that with a, a shell script that was installing everything, and then we've automated that um, uh, with the install. So let's talk a little bit about the middleware layer. So what does armor actually look like? Um, so armor, you have your input interfaces um, coming in, um, which basically logical bubble of netmap. Um, passive mode, is, or if you're pass-through mode, it's up here. If you're in kind of a passive state, if you're doing encapsulation, you go through this communications manager. And if you're analyzing the traffic, which hopefully is always the case, then you're dumping into, into Bro. Um, all of these, uh, this entire communication manager block is all um, our, our own code effectively. And we've added some hooks and some Bro scripts and other things in, into Bro here. And we have configuration and other things that are, that are on the system as well. Um, so I'm not here to, to sell a product, by the way. Um, this is university research, and this is all open source. So all of this is going back into the community in various different ways. So the Armor Proxy, it's really just an abstract class for middleware implementation. So we say, we're going to take the original payload, the original packet coming across, make it a payload 
a byte chunk effectively of an encapsulated layer and transmit it across. Um, so we use 0MQ for that. DDS is also stubbed in but not fully implemented. The reason for that is the open source libraries don't have the security layer implemented. Um, the security layer is in a pre-ratified standard um, uh, phase for DDS at this point. Um, all sorts of logging and other things. And um, the Armor Proxy also acts kind of as a basic Mac layer sort of router to, to keep track of communications to know where to send things um, on, on the system. So 0MQ, um, if you're not familiar with it, it's an asynchronous messaging library. Um, all sorts of different things that you can do. Um, doesn't require a message broker, so you can have point-to-point -point communications. You can have more complex hierarchies. Um, lots of different languages it supports. It's open source. Um, documentation in an active community. There's all sorts of patterns you can use, just standard client, client server models, um, push-pull, um, pub-sub, et cetera, et cetera. So Armor's using what's called the dealer router pattern, um, which looks like this. It allows us to do point to multi-point um, and adds fault tolerance and redundancy effectively so we can send streams to multiple locations if we choose to do so. Um, and so our, our control center is effectively acting as the router or the server in the case. So if you look at things like DDS versus um, 0MQ, generally speaking, DDS is commercial product. There are some open source libraries, but they're not fully implemented. Um, they have lots of, of aspects in there like um, topic selection and quality of service and other features that are really useful, but not necessarily absolutely required. Um, a lot less language support and other things as well, um, except for when you start getting into the more proprietary um, uh, embedded system builds. Um, and it's kind of uh, restricted to a pub-sub style model. Um, but it does support fault tolerance and multi-streams and other things like that. So um, administering the box, we have to do that from a couple different perspectives. One is administering the configuration and actually the bro policies, which I'll talk a little bit about as well. Um, and uh, so all of that's built on basically a, a decoupled front-end, back-end architecture, JSON API going back and forth between the different systems. Um, endpoints don't really matter too much, but there's various different um, endpoints that are here. Um, so configuration, notifications, various other things that you can pull out of the system just um, via a JSON object that comes out. So here's the part where it starts getting interesting. So what did we do in Bro? Why is this of interest to you guys? Um, so we, we created basically a, a, a analyzer for um, the ICS protocol. So first off, the DNP3 analyzer that's in Bro today, if anyone uses that. Um, so that was original work from our T sub G effort, the Trustworthy Cyber Infrastructure for the Power Grid. So we've taken and leveraged that and the Modbus um, uh, uh, parser that's in there as well to then create more intelligence around the ICS communications. Um, so we use Bro scripting engine obviously for this and right now we're doing DNP3 and Modbus but the approach has been made generic so that it can apply to anything else. And we've actually did it, uh, done this with HTTP and some other things as well. Um, so at a base structure, what's it look like? Um, it's broken into a couple different modules. Um, the network traffic comes in, it goes through a Bro script effectively that's um, doing the basis of the traffic statistics and we um, collecting those and then we have a counter that's counting them. Whoa, hello. Um, that's counting them. Um, we created a basic anomaly detection framework as well, um, going to the behavioral analysis question that's there. So we're doing some of that in the ICS space, which is a very restricted domain. Um, and then we've done some pattern-based identity recognition stuff that's in there too. That's really a precursor proof of concept to what we want to really do. And I'll talk about each of these. So the traffic statistics collector, um, obviously the inputs, the network traffic, the output are two kinds of events that fire from that um, item seen and item gen. Um, item seen is instantaneous, but it's incomplete. Um, and item gen is the final uh, step of, of what's uh, firing. The reason why this is important um, in terms of breaking these events apart is obviously the event-driven architecture, um, but also um, that they were broken into modules so that these could feed into different aspects. So item gen feeds into pattern identity recognition and logging, and item seen goes into the traffic statistics counter. And I'll explain what these both output uh, in a moment here. So to give you an idea of, of what this looks like and how it performed, we took the um, standard Modbus traces that are available in the Bro example uh, PCAP um, that has an average packet interval of about seven milliseconds, average burst of about two seconds, um, 32 packets in the average burst length. Um, it's a trace over one hour and two minutes um, and about 60,000 packets. So we ran that as our kind of performance benchmark to look at overhead for this. By the way, the statistic framework, if I um, haven't made it clear already, is built around the sum stat stuff. So this is bro cluster supported and everything as well. Um, so what it allows us to do is to look at, at various different levels of the system. So um, I should have put a slide in here that talks about the levels, but what the statistics is, is um, getting us is, at the first level, it's what are the sources? 
So who's talking? Okay. Second level is who they're talking to. Third level is what protocol they're talking. Fourth level is what functions they're targeting. And then the fifth level is what the targets are of those functions. So in DNP3, an example would be host A is talking to host B, speaking protocol DNP3, requesting a DNP3 read, and it's of coil one. Okay, so that would be what the hierarchy is. And if you see one of those packets, then that count goes to one. Um, oh, so five levels. Um, there's timing at each of these. So these, these slides are actually going to show performance of what the impact is of this. Um, you have your sender and receiver extract time, your item, team, item scene trigger time, extractor switching time, protocol and function extraction time, trigger time again, switching time, extracting, rinse and repeat, right, as you go through each of these. Um, so the total runtime is the aggregation of all of these across. So if you look at doing the full five levels, so all the way down to, to the level, you're looking at overhead effectively total runtime of 48-ish or so microseconds. Um, so very small overhead. The SumStats framework is actually quite performant, and, and Bro is, um, is performant in that regards as well. Um, so you start looking at the three to four runtime, same sort of thing, stopping at what functions effectively are being called, um, and you're looking at you know 32-ish microseconds or so total, total runtime um, for four. And if you look at three, you're sub 30 microseconds of overhead per packet. Um, one to two, total runtime again. Um, is, so that's just host source destination. Um, so you're looking at sub 15 microseconds on uh, both two level and about the same performance on one level. So if you start looking at the, the run times of the, of the levels as they go up, um, you'll see, so the red is showing the standard deviation, effectively the variance there. Um, and so at five, you'll see a little bit more variance. And the reason for that is the diversity or, of the communication. So how many different targets are being targeted effectively? And that's because of a B-tree hierarchy that's formed. So what's it actually look like? So it looks like this. Um, you basically have your root, uh, a dummy root node. You have, um, and you form a, a multi-level statistics tree um, as you go through. So each sender has then children node of the receivers that they talk to, which then have which protocols they communicated for that sender receiver pair and the functions associated with those and then the corresponding targets. Right? Um, it also stores some other things which are response ratios. If you request to have that, that's an option to the script and a response delay. So you can actually track the not just the request but also its response pair to look at the delay in the communication or latency in that original communication. So when you start looking at um, the actual traffic statistics counter, so that's just building the collection. So that's building the statistics tree effectively, right? So now you want to actually start counting these. When you start counting these, you feed the, those trees into the item scene events into the item counter effectively. And then, as you all know, the sum stats framework runs on an aggregation interval. Um, so you specify that to be every um, T sub P in this case. Um, and, uh, and then you get an aggregated finished event effectively that fires in the end. Um, so if you start looking at, at this for, again, the same trace, the same Modbus trace, um, the, uh, the collector running at, on its own, again, sub 50 microseconds, when you add the collector plus the counter, um, you get down to the you know, sort of 180-ish sort of microsecond level. So still pretty quick for this trace. Um, so again, variance as you start going through there. Um, and to pull out a little bit more statistics on, on the Modbus, there were eight senders and eight receivers, one protocol since it was a Modbus specific trace, you only expect to see Modbus in there. Um, there were 262 functions that, that were called and 37 targets of that. Um, so again, looking at the total processing time across the different levels as you start going. Generally, it's fairly linear. So when you start looking at aggregation time, things aren't quite as linear, um, and that's because of the fact that it's a tree, right? So you have more nodes as you're going further and further down in the tree because there's more functions being called or more um, targets being called. Now, in the real world, there may not be that number of functions called, right? So your real world performance is going to be based on how dynamic, effectively, the communications patterns are of the systems. But again, <clears throat> aggregation um, time is still relatively reasonable. I mean, you're talking in worst case, um, with a 20-minute aggregation, you're looking at two, two and a half seconds, right? And that's done every 20 minutes. So anomaly detection. 
Um, the basic anomaly detection is really, really simplistic at the moment. It's um, becoming more advanced, but what's implemented at this point is simplistic. So obviously we have a B-tree hierarchy from the statistics that we can do. So we can start looking at things like the counts of each nodes and the corresponding children um, that tell you how many times something is communicated to a particular device or asked a particular protocol or targeted a particular function. So obviously SCADA traffic itself is periodic, right? So these systems operate in control loops. They say, read this value, okay, that's good. Read this value, okay, that's good. And they keep pulling like this over and over again. So since you have this periodicity, you have a kind of standard pattern that you can look at, allowing you to look at anomalies very simplistically. So you may vary in a short period of time. If you look at one second, you may not see something communicate. But if you look over a longer period of time, you'll see it communicate and it'll have that particular pattern. So in this case, it's just a construction of a normal tree. We aggregate the various, or we take the various different counts across an aggregated tree and then bring all those together to create a normalized tree of what the traffic pattern looks like over a set of intervals, effectively. Um, so in this case, we just implemented a basic threshold check that says, okay, if you've talked more than your normalized tree amount says you normally talk to this by a certain threshold, alarm. Okay? And it alarms by sending a notice that you can choose whatever you want to do on. So again, eight senders, eight receivers, one protocol, 262 functions, 37 targets. So if you look at anomaly detection, when you get down to um, the third level, um, everything is, you know, 500 milliseconds or, or 500 microseconds or so up to level three. And then you start getting the state explosion from the functions and the targets, so you, you know, shoot up uh, quite a bit. Um, but you can do basic anomaly detection still in the sub six second sort of realm. So then we said, all right, well, that's great, but what if, so if I know who's talking and I know what they're talking, how can I take that further? So a little bit of background, in industrial control systems, um, specifically in the power grid, you have these things called NERC SIPs, um, which are regulations. And what they um, have you do is they apply to particular types of devices that are doing particular types of functions or activities, right? So you can say something is called a critical asset. So a critical asset means that it's connected to a certain power line voltage level, or it has a certain um, aspect of it that's controlling primary functions that help keep the lights on. So that's kind of a rough idea of what a critical asset is. Critical assets have regulation applied to them. Non-critical assets have looser regulation, but some still have regulation. So if you have this, um, this device, right? So if I, if I know right now, the current state of utility is, is I don't know anything about my system. I know what my devices are, but I can't tell you what their IPs are. I can't tell you if they're up or down, what they're saying, how often they're saying it, or anything like that. So if I can plug something in that will give me a map of the system, that will tell me what the devices are, et cetera, that sounds really great, right? So we tried to do that. And we said, all right, well, based on the communication patterns, can I tell what this device is? So let me give you an example. Um, for those familiar with DNP3, um, there's a particular uh, function called SBO, which is select before operate. So the only device that should ever really be replying to, a, to an SBO message is a relay. Because what that says basically is open up a breaker. Okay. So if I see an SBO message go to a particular device and I see an affirmative response for that, then I can probably surmise that that was a relay, right? And then I also know what functions it's been targeting. So I know reads, for instance, that, that have been reading that relay. So I can also look at the values of those reads. So if I look at the values of those reads and I see that the voltage level that it's reporting is above 69 kV then I know that, oh, it's a relay, and it's connected to a critical asset line of 69 kV or higher. Therefore, it's a critical asset. So if I can start identifying things like that, then I can start writing policy around that. So rather than saying, oh, host A, I can say, if host is a critical asset, apply this policy to it. So we started to do that. We looked at the identity framework for that. And this is some basic work in the identity framework. The identity framework is a bit of a shoehorn for this. It's not really the right thing, but it was a starting point to start playing. Um, so we use the identity framework, again, fairly performant. Um, and if you run the collector only, remember we were in the sub 50 microsecond sort of range. If you add the identity recognizer, um, we go into like the 55 second sort of range, 55 microsecond sort of range. So still pretty good. So what can you do with this, right? So you can. As I said, the SBO message as an example. I can start reasoning about these and reasoning about the communication patterns, reasoning about the responsibility of the asset rather than just say host A. And do so in a somewhat generic way. I can create a critical asset policy. Right? So what are policies? Policies are bro scripts, effectively, that say what to do 
with an alarm. Um, they have an enforcement layer that, that, um, that we've uh, hooked effectively. So Bro obviously can exec a program. So we're just basically execing um, IP tables, rules, and other things like that to, to manipulate the stream um, in terms of dropping and blocking. Now, dropping and blocking is, is interesting in industrial control systems because of two, um, two aspects. One is that they're critical assets, right? So these are things that help keep the lights on. I want to be 100% sure if I'm going to block something that I'm blocking the right thing. Because if I don't, then maybe the lights go off or maybe somebody dies, right? So bad things happen if you do the wrong thing. And even on normal networks, you don't want to do the wrong thing, right? You don't want to cause service to go out or whatever it may be or somebody can't reach you know, Google if they want to go to Google. Um, so it's really, really important that you do the right thing, right? So the other aspect is Industrial control systems are very time critical. So why have I been talking about time overhead in so much of this? So a control loop communication has to complete within four milliseconds, um, which basically means you have you know, one to two milliseconds of network communication time, and you have two milliseconds to do what you need to do. Um, so if you're going to try to stop something in real time, you have about two milliseconds to do it on the box. It's a long time, right? Kind of. but. If you want to be 100% sure that you're going to stop something, then you probably can't do that in two milliseconds. You may need more packets. You may need you know, the full conversation to understand what's going on. And then you may be, after you know, two or three commands, you may be like, oh, that one, two commands ago, I shouldn't have allowed through because these set of commands are now bad. Right? Um, that gets to the semantic reasoning sort of aspect. So if you do that, um, if you have these reasoning layers that you have to do, what do you do? Well. So what we've decided to do is to err, basically, on the side of caution, to allow communications through by default, not stopping any communications, but being able to retroactively apply it. And then alarm any time we decide that, hey, we should have applied something, and something that has passed through has violated it. So that the operators are now aware that, hey, something bad happened, and they can go take corrective actions if they need to. And if you choose enforcement, it'll actually block that from happening again, rather than just alarming. So one of the keys there is the visibility of what's really going on. Right? They don't know what's going on on the network. It also helps them with future planning, so capacity planning and other things associated with these communications networks. Do they know they're running out of bandwidth, for instance, at substations? These substations are often deployed with just like single T1 lines in remote areas, for instance, or Wi-Fi communications even. So they can have all sorts of problems. Um, Encryption is also interesting. So, all right, well, let's say we start encrypting or we use an encrypted protocol. I can still build statistics around the, the encrypted protocol. I can still reason about encrypted communications as to what's going on inside those because most encryption adds a constant um, size, effectively overhead, on the original payload. And if I can look at payload sizes, then I can sort of roughly classify those systems, right? Um, you can also use this for fault tolerance. So you can look at communications. You can look at response rates, latencies, dropped packets, requests that never received responses, et cetera, and use that to set up a more fault-tolerant architecture, looking at either network solutions to that or by using multi-path communications or other things. <clears throat> so when you're deploying critical ac assets, you have to test very um, thoroughly to make sure that these operate correctly. So we have a basic little configuration in, in the test lab um, that we're just pumping data effectively through to an armor node, which then is just hitting what we're calling an armor router, but it's really just a, a router, you know, a Cisco router equivalent that's being done in Linux, um, joining two different networks together, to another armor node, um, and then to a, a source destination. So really basic config. Um, when we're doing proxy testing, same sort of thing, um, but we have the encapsulated um, testing there. Um, you can just use basic iperf or, or anything else to, to dump traffic through to kind of look at performance of the node and other things along those lines. Um, so the Armor Proxy, by the way, has multiple modes. Um, it can truly operate transparently, just encapsulating and de-encapsulating. Um, it can um, do Mac manipulation or ARP spoofing effectively um, to capture traffic if you need to capture in that way. Um, and uh, uh, well, there's, there's another way it can operate as well, which is not working so well, so I won't talk about that one. <laughs> um, so. Uh, um, on one side, we'll just do an iperf. On the other side, we'll do a TCP dump and look at, look at the traffic. Um, we have sender-receiver pairs, and we have test harnesses that I'll talk about here in a bit as well. Um, so you can obviously use packagen as well and do netmap-related um, uh, pipes if you want. 
um, that, that goes through. Um, so it's great that we have a little toy, you know, Linux box sort of system that's sending arbitrary stuff. You can use ping if you want, you know, just to send traffic around. Who cares, right? But um, we also have real gear. So we have an extensive test bed um, at the University of Illinois um, that's been developed over uh, about the past nine years or so. It has about $6.5 million worth of power grid equipment in various different forms. So we actually can run simulated power grids um, on things like these two units here, which are the RTDS. Um, I guess I have a pointer. Maybe. Maybe not. There we go. So here we have um, two RTDS units, real-time digital simulators. They're high-fidelity power simulators. Um, these are all Schweitzer Engineering relays and, and uh, um, substation computers and gateways. Um, more uh, Schweitzer gear, and there's some GE gear down here as well. We have some ABB relays and other things. This is a digital controller for nuclear reactors. There's a whole bunch of computation and other stuff uh, behind here as well um, in a portable lab environment. Um, there's also smart meters. Um, this is our own research platform that we built that emulates smart meters um, but allows researchers to, to arbitrarily hook them. Real smart meters, this is ITRON's open way architecture, um, GPS feeds and other things. Then we also have field assets. So those are some solar arrays that we have on our South Research Park that are um, outputting data to the testbed as well. So the key is, is, all right, well, we test it on the bench, right? But we can actually put it behind these real devices and the real IEDs and have them communicating through and making sure that their operation isn't affected either, including doing control loop actions and various other aspects. So we talked specifically about the SCADA and ICS testing. Um, DNP3 and Modbus test harnesses um, are both present. So we use OpenDNP3, um, which is an open source DNP3 implementation by Adam Crane of Automatic. And then we use uh, PyModbus um, for the Modbus implementation. We just have performance tests and communication tests and compliance tests that we run back and forth through the system. So looking at the raw pro uh, protocol communications, making sure that they behave appropriately at the stack level um, through this. There's also commercial ones available that we have, and we might be able to leverage those um, for this. Um, so we also uh, brought in Justin's uh, bro stats um, So we actually are, are pulling that sort of stuff and looking at general aspects. Here's um, bro stats looking at some of the Modbus communications just running through a, a test harness. Um, real basic dashboard of, of the graphs, but um, looking at the packets received, the processing time in the system. Um, that one's DMP3, so that's intentionally ignored, um, and the Modbus communication. So um, trying to incorporate as much of the open source stuff that's out there and really build upon it rather than inventing the wheel again or doing our own custom visualization. Um, there was a, there's a company that's here that, that has a really nice visualization platform over there too, and great thing is, is it could probably be pointed at this and, and just work or this could be incorporated into it. So when I say incorporated into, again, remember this is all open source. So where's this stuff going? Um, so we're building example policies based around NERPS, NERC SIP requirements and other things along those lines, or things that um, ICS devices really just shouldn't be doing. So we're going to create basically a library of these that people can then build on. And if time allows, um, we have about a year and a couple months or so left in the project, we're actually going to have kind of a drag and drop um, uh, policy builder associated with this that they'll then fill in details by answering questions. Um, the enforcement actions are IP tables hooks. Um, those are being implemented as we speak. Um, and then looking at some more advanced analytics. So we, we built this analytics tree. Now what are the cool things that we can start doing with this? And what can we start using this reasoning for? Um, and adding things like, well, all right, normally um, I don't just see request response pairs for something, but let's say, um, uh, I don't know, like a DNP3 SBO message. So if I see a DNP3 SBO message go across um, and I don't see an affirmative acknowledgement about that, then I want to take an action because I should see an affirmative acknowledgement. It should never fail to open the breaker if it's being requested to open the breaker. But there are cases that it does. Um, so another piece of work that can feed into this is there's a TCIP-G effort that, uh, um, that bolts effectively or can bolt effectively right into this, which says, all right, well, I have all this information that's going across, and effectively it's network communication information. It's just the packets going around, right? But all of this data feeds into real things in the grid. Um, so one of those real things is called state estimation. So state estimation tells you what the current state of the grid is in a particular 
uh, case. So how power is flowing, what needs to be done, and there's contingency cases effectively with that. So state estimation has to come to um, basically to a resolution when you run it. If you can't um, if you can't get a solution, then that means the grid is in a bad state, a negative state. So you can take and feed that information from the DNP3 packets, because you've already parsed them, into a state estimator and say, OK, from a physical side, are these responses and requests going across correct? Are they physically possible? So that work is being done by, by a, a PhD student at, at the University of Illinois under the TCG effort um, in collaboration with, uh, with some bro people as well, I believe. Um, uh, and uh, um, would bolt right into this. So what do, you, what do you get from that, right? So we're talking all about networking here, but now we can start reasoning about what these network packets are actually used for as well and run those same calculations and other aspects. So I mentioned we created a bro sharp extension. Um, so why did we do that? So Grid Protection Alliance has this whole thing that they call their TSF, which is their time series framework. And what it's designed for is to take time series data and do these grid-based calculations, grid-based reasoning, um, collection storage, it's archiving, et cetera, around that. So we said, all right, that's great. We can feed off these data streams to that, and we can use that for computation. And we did that originally via Broccoli. You'll hear here in a moment that uh, that, that work is obsoleted, um, which we knew going into it, but that's great. You got to keep up with the, with the pace of science, right? Um, so we we dumped off to that, and then now we can run computations of anything in, um, in that framework. So we can do state estimation, we can do variance, we can do all sorts of other things that are, that are going on there. Since we already did the heavy lifting of parsing it, why not just send it the data, right? You can arbitrarily do that on site, too, so you could run um, uh, any of those computations on the box itself, but you probably don't want to be running those on the probe. So the architecture is meant to be distributed and meant to be farmed out, so you can do this across, say, a whole computation farm if you want. Um, another aspect with the analytics is beyond the computations, I want to also just know what this network looks like, right? What devices are actually there and communicating and what does that topology look like? So NERC SIP regulations, one of the first things they ask for when a NERC, when a NERC auditor comes in is give me your network map. And so they give them a network map and they take that network map and then they go and look at what device by device with a checkbox effectively and say, okay, this device I see in that substation, this device I see in that substation, et cetera. They don't verify that its IP is actually what they say it is or that there are any other devices there, but what you say is there is there. Often cases, there's much more that's there that's actually not on this map. It's always incomplete. And I mean, how many of you guys do network operations? How many of you have a complete map of every single device that's on your network at any given moment? Right? Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a big problem everywhere, right? So that has applicability even beyond the ICS space just to automate a map of what this stuff looks like. And not just that, but you can also then start overlaying communications on there and say, okay, well, now let me see all the devices that communicate DNP3. Or let me see all of the devices that communicate more than X number of bytes um, on average across a particular period of time. Or show me what the capacity looks like as I add more of these devices. So you can start reasoning about those and adding layers like that. Um, we're going to try to update to Debian 8. Uh, they, they changed a lot, so it's, uh, <laughs> um, that'll be interesting. But um, So they, they moved to, to systemd and other in the 4.0 Linux kernel, and 4.0 Linux kernel is a little, little hokey right now. Um, we'll also uh, be moving to broker, which you'll hear about in a little bit. <laughs> um, so broccoli's being phased out, so it, um, broker is going to be the replacement but not quite yet the replacement because it's not unstable, right? Or is it unstable now? It's working for production grade enterprise systems. Yeah, okay. Um, so we'll eventually be moving to broker and there's a transition path and, and uh, Robin will be talking about that too. Um, and then visualization. So we have the bro stats D stuff. Um, we're also going to be incorporated some other basic monitoring um, and then some custom monitoring specific to ICS as well. Um, so I told you I had a lot of slides. I did it in the time frame allocated. So if you're interested in this, um, yardlateillinois.edu to reach out to me. Um, as I mentioned, everything is going to be open source in a permissive license, so a BSD variant effectively. 
Um, so all this is integratable with products. All this is, is leverageable. Pieces of it can be used in any sort of way. Um, we're approaching an alpha release. I think it's slated for um, September 1st. Is that right, September 1st, guys? September 1st, um, we're going to be pushing out an alpha. Um, it'll be a GitHub um, Armor repository. Um, and that'll have at least the current underpinnings of, of the stats collection and other aspects. Um, we have allowed a couple people in the Bro community to play with the stats stuff already um, on higher links that they won't tell us anything about. Um, and uh, it's apparently been quite interesting for them. So we've gotten some good feedback from that. Um, hopefully, they're using it for good things. Um, but if you're interested, in helping, interested in, in contributing, interested in leveraging, um, reach out.